Wouldn't you know it? This weekend, a perfect time for people to get out to look at the night sky, and it's going to be cloudy here on the East Coast. Good evening, everybody. My name is Derek Pitts. I'm the Chief Astronomer and Planetarium Programs Director at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And welcome to the January edition of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is our regular monthly astronomy program that we've put together to supplant what we normally do down at the Franklin Institute every month that we've done for quite a long time. And that is our Night Skies at the Observatory program. For that program, we invite the general public to come down and make use of all the resources we have, our rooftop observatory, uh, our fifth floor deck observatory, our planetarium, and all of our other resources to provide an astronomy evening for you to enjoy. You can come down and look through our telescopes, learn about different aspects of astronomy and space exploration, and have a really wonderful evening. We've been doing that program at Franklin for quite some time. But since the pandemic, we've been doing this program at home since we haven't been able to bring everybody together at the observatory downtown. So this program, Night Skies at Home, is the home version of that. We invite you to pick up all sorts of information here that you can use right where you live to observe the night sky, learn a little bit about the night sky, and reconnect with the universe. All of the content that we pre present here is content that you can use to observe no matter where you are, whether you're in an urban environment, whether you're in a rural environment, the information that we use about the night sky, the constellations, the planetary visibility, the moon phases, all of that will be useful to you no matter where you're observing. So as long as you're somewhere in this latitude, not too far from this latitude, you'll be in good shape. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, somewhere uh, down in South America, yeah, perhaps this won't work out as well for you, uh, but for just about everybody else, this should work out fairly well. So we invite you to join us this evening and pick up some information that you can use to enjoy the night sky. It's also a great opportunity to invite your little family unit to go outside and learn the sky as well. Now, admittedly, it is cold at this time of the year for those of us up here in the northern portion of the northern hemisphere, but it's still a great time to start to learn constellations. The skies can be very clear during the winter, that is when it's not cloudy or snowing or something like that, and there are great stars to be seen, great constellations to be seen, and easy patterns to recognize in the sky as well. So we invite you to pick up some information and use that information to reconnect with the night sky. All sorts of great stuff to be seen, uh, so we invite you to pick up that information here and uh, go out and look at the night sky. On our program tonight, uh, we are doing a number of things. First of all, we'll have the winter sky highlights, what constellations are available to be seen at this time of this year, what planets are visible this month, when you can see them and where you have to look to see them. We'll talk about International Space Station, its visibility, and the number of people that are in space right now. But we're also going to spend some time talking with a planetary geologist about an interesting concept about changing other planets to be more like Earth, something called terraforming. You may have heard this term used with relation to the planet Mars and the idea of turning Mars into a more Earth-like planet. And this would be called terraforming Mars. We're gonna talk about what it means when we say terraforming. We'll talk about what might go into terraforming a planet. We'll talk about the possibilities of terraforming Mars. So again, this is Night Skies at Home, the January 2022 uh, edition. And uh, we're glad to have you with us tonight. We're running about a week late this month, but that's okay. All the information is still good. We normally do this program the first Thursday night of every month. And that's when you'll see us next month too, the first Thursday night of the month. Okay, well, let's get started by uh, looking at some sky. Oh, I know one other thing I forgot to mention. Uh, where are you listening to this program? Where are you hearing this program from? Please let us know where you are hearing this program. We'd love to know about that. And uh, let me just introduce uh, in the back room is our technical producer. Katie's in the background there taking care of all the technical stuff over here. And uh, over here in the studio is my studio producer, Linda. Say hi, Linda. There she is over there. And Linda's going to be feeding me your questions and also letting me know uh, where you're uh, listening to the program from. And I understand uh, you already have some folks. Oh, yeah. 
Florida. Woohoo, Pensacola, Florida. Hey there. West Virginia. West Virginia, nice. Philly, Delaware, New Jersey. Philadelphia, Delaware, New Jersey, right here in the tri state area. You know, for you guys, the International Space Station information will be particularly pertinent, but don't worry, everybody else, you can also get that information. Who else? We got Reno, Nevada. Reno, Nevada. Let's see who's there. Anybody yeah. else? Mount Hood in Oregon. Mount Hood. Wow. All the way out in Oregon. Fabulous. Thanks for being with us. South Philly, Westchester, and Yaden. South Philly, Westchester, and Yaden. All great places. You know, no matter where you are, you all have great skies. Even if you're right here in Yaden or if you're in South Philadelphia or at Mount Hood, you still have great skies. The only difference is it may be darker out near Mount Hood, perhaps, than it is right here, but there's still great stuff for everybody to see. All right, so let's start out with some basic sky phenomenon, and then we'll uh, move on into some more uh, interesting aspects of the program, some more of the in-depth stuff. So sky phenomenon for this month of this year. Here we are in January 2022. And uh, sunrise now is coming at 7.20 a.m. for folks that live around this latitude. That's 40 degrees north around Philadelphia's latitude, about 7.20 in the morning. Now, we've already had our latest sunrise, which is about 7.22 a couple of days ago. And now what's happening is that sunrises are beginning to come earlier. 7.20 is where we are right now. And we're actually uh, gaining about a minute per day, a little bit more than a minute per day. And that also is helped by the fact that sunsets are now coming later. Back in December, sunsets were coming as early as 4.35 in the afternoon. But sunsets now are at 4.59. That's for tomorrow, 4.59. So by Saturday, sunset will be at 5 p.m. Now, when you combine the earlier sunrises and the later sunsets, we're starting to see the number of hours and minutes of daylight begin to expand again. So right now we're up to nine hours and 38 minutes of daylight. And as I said, we're adding a little more than a minute per day. So we're gonna see that uh, sunlight time during the course of the day uh, start to grow rapidly as we head on toward the next season. We actually had uh, perihelion just last week. Perihelion was on January 4th. That was the point in the Earth's orbit when the Earth is closest to the sun. It may seem counterintuitive that the Earth can be closer to the sun, yet for those of us in the northern hemisphere, the temperatures can be lower. But if you're in the southern hemisphere, then it all makes sense because closer to the sun, that portion of the Earth is tipped toward the sun. So it's summertime for those folks in the southern hemisphere, wintertime for those of us here in the northern hemisphere. All this seasonal stuff is tied to the fact that the Earth's rotational axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees away from vertical. And that allows solar radiation to wax and wane according to whether, the whether this portion of the Earth is tilted toward the sun or tilted away from the sun. It's all about gain of radiation from the sun, not the distance. We're at our closest distance to the sun right now. We'll be at our greatest distance from the sun Guess when? Yeah, early July, early July. So as I say, maybe it's counterintuitive, but indeed that's the way it works. So here we are at this point of the year and we're just starting to really feel those cold temperatures up here in the North as the Northern portion of the planet has been cooling down as we've been losing sunlight. Now we'll start to gain it. Things will start to warm up again. The moon, well, uh, the next full moon is coming up on Monday. So next Monday, January 17th, we'll be at full moon. Be another two weeks until we get to the new moon coming after that. So right now you can see the moon in the evening sky. If you go outside now where you are, the sky is clear, you'll be able to catch the moon without too much difficulty at all. But you can also catch some really cool planets that are out available and visible for you to see. And uh, it's a really great chance for you to get out and see two really cool planets, of course, the two showpiece planets of the solar system, Jupiter and Saturn are visible in the southwest just after sunset. But there's an added treat for those of you that have a clear view of the southwestern horizon. If you have a clear view of the southwestern horizon after sunset, but before the sky gets dark, so we're talking about that period of time between, say, 5.30 and 6 p.m., the elusive tiny planet Mercury is available to be seen. Now, Mercury being closest to the sun, 
doesn't take much time to orbit around the sun once. It is the fastest orbit of all orbits. And so that means that Mercury is not gonna be in our sky very long in this particular portion of its visibility. So you've got about a week and a half perhaps to catch Mercury in the evening sky. Low on the southwestern horizon, a pair of binoculars will help, but I have to caution you, make sure the sun has set. We don't want you anywhere near the sun trying to view something with a pair of binoculars. So again, the sun has to be set. The sky has to be starting to get darker so that Mercury will begin to appear. So between 5.30 and 6 p.m., that's going to be a good time to try it. By 6 p.m., Mercury will have already set. And by this time next week, it'll be gone from the sky. So you have just this window of opportunity to catch it on this trip around the sun on this portion, I should say, on this particular portion of its orbit around the sun. Since it takes such a short time to go around, it'll be back again pretty soon, uh, but you can give it a shot right now, along with Saturn and Jupiter. And uh, when we get to looking at the star maps, you'll see how all this goes together in the sky, and you'll be able to catch that without too much difficulty. As I said, there are winter constellations that we can check out. That'll be perfect for you to see. It's the winter circle of constellations now. We talked the uh, last time around about the end of the fall constellations, and we still could see just hanging on low in the western sky one of the constellations of the summer sky that was still around. The, what now looks like a cross, Cygnus over on the western sky, uh, Cygnus the Swan in this particular configuration at that time of year, I should say in December, was standing upright on the nose of the swan in the sky. So it looked like a great cross. You can call it the Northern Cross, if you will. Uh, but now that's passed and is very, very low on the Western horizon by 9 p.m. Half the cross is gone. And that major constellation of the fall sky, the great square of Pegasus, has now replaced it over in the West. This means a whole new crop of constellations have now taken over the keystone section of the sky, 9 p.m. directly ahead in the south, the winter circle. The winter circle is centered on the bright and easy to recognize constellation Orion the Hunter, seven bright stars arranged in a shape that's easy for everybody to pick up. And then around Orion in that circle are the other constellations of the winter circle. And we'll talk about them in detail. Uh, when we go back to take a look at our star maps. So there's a lot of great stuff to see in the sky, easy targets for you to take a look for, easy targets for that great new holiday gift, that telescope that you receive. This is a perfect opportunity to aim it towards Jupiter and Saturn and get a look at these two showpiece articles of the night sky in the planet realm, and also plenty of other really cool objects for you to try to grab a hold of with your telescope or your binoculars as well. So you can give all of those a try. Uh, we'll come back and look at these in a little bit more detail a little bit later in the program. But I want to get to the heart of our program right now, our guest this evening. Uh, joining me this evening is a planetary geologist who has spent a tremendous amount of his time as a researcher, not only understanding the atmosphere of the planet Mars, it's his specialty planet, I think I can say, but he also has focused on the creation of dust devils in the Martian atmosphere on the surface of Mars. So I think this person really can help us a tremendous amount understand uh, about the atmosphere of Mars, about dust devils and the formation of dust devils, and perhaps even help us better understand the possibilities of maybe trying to convert Mars into a planet like our own. Please join me in welcoming to our program tonight, Dr. Steven Metzger, a planetary geologist who's gonna help us talk a little bit about Mars and Mars terraforming. Good evening, Steve, thanks for joining us. Howdy, Derek, good to be here. We're so glad you could be with us tonight. You know, uh, Mars has certainly been high on the list of target objects that everybody is always interested in understanding more about as a planet. Uh, mostly, I think, because of the fact that it has been the subject of so many science fiction stories and movies and just everything else, uh, and has been the target 
uh, and the object of plenty of speculation about the possibility of life elsewhere in our solar system, more so than any other place in our solar system. So maybe it makes sense that this is the place that uh, not only is uh, next on the list, I should say, um, after, after the moon, next on the list of places that are being targeted for uh, human exploration, but also uh, probably the place that at the top of the list for consideration of trying to convert over to be more like our planet Earth. So uh, I'm glad you could be with us, Steve, to talk about this. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the work that you do researching Mars, the Martian atmosphere, and understanding how dust devils form on Mars. Well, I, I do mostly study dust devils. I have a specialty in how surface processes work on Earth and on Earth-like planets. And that's actually the big thing about Mars is that it is Earth-like in many tantalizing ways, but it's definitely a substantially different place. Um, in some ways, Venus, the next one closer to the sun from us, is more Earth-like in its size and, and its mass and so forth, but it is an extremely hostile environment on the surface. Something like 900 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 90 times the atmospheric pressure. Every time the US and the Soviets have sent any spacecraft to the surface of that planet, they're designed not to be crushed instantly. And I think the best one lasted maybe a couple of hours um, from the Soviets. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Mars, yeah. on the other hand, is about half the diameter, and it has um, only roughly 40% of the gravity as Earth does. And its day is almost the same. It's 37 minutes longer than our 24-hour day. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's very similar. So um, we are interested in Mars, and NASA, and now flotillas of spacecraft from multiple countries are either at Mars or on their way. Uh, everybody's interested in Mars. Um, there might be resources there. There might be a chance to start a second civilization there. Um, so it's drawing a lot of interest. Um, however, we need to do a bunch of things. We need to understand it more before we commit to uh, any of our fancy plans. And we're constantly learning more and more, tremendous amounts more. But we also, um, we also need to keep those spacecraft from crashing. So in order to uh, land anything properly, you need to understand the structure of the atmosphere, what layers are in motion, what ones are warmer, or cooler, um, all so that the engineers can finally tune in just how to land safely and later take off successfully and safely. So um, it turns out that Mars has an extremely dusty atmosphere compared to Earth. It's about 20, 30 times dustier on a nice clear day on Mars versus a nice clear day on Earth. And there's been some effort to try to understand how does the dust get up there? The atmosphere is really thin. It's substantial for a planet, but compared to Earth, it's, it's a 1% the, the atmospheric pressure, and sometimes it's even less than that at different parts of the surface. And it's really pretty cold too. So trying to understand how Mars uh, gets dusty has been a goal for a number of us. Well, wait, before you go on, I want to go back to one thing you just mentioned that I think it's really important for our audience to understand. Well, factual and true, Derek. <laughs> of course, I believe every word of it. But Excellent. I think what you said was, and, and, and this is certainly true, is that the Martian atmosphere is only 1% the atmosphere of Earth. Yep. That's so, what they so, so, the, so Earth's atmosphere is 99% denser. It's than the Martian atmosphere. I'm, I'm a, I've, I've forgotten this little comparison, but I think it's, if we could uh, stand on a, on a uh, mountaintop that was maybe 25, 30,000 feet above sea level, I think that's as thick as the Martian atmosphere gets down at the lowest point on the Martian surface. I hope I got that right, but it's- Wow. It, so, so it's equal to what the atmosphere would be like, what the atmosphere would be like here on Earth if we were to stand on, say, Mount Everest. And then, above, and you might have to be a mile or two above Mount Everest. Still higher. Right. So it's, wow. it's pretty thin. 
Um, apparently, if the wind blows real hard and you were out there with everything else being equal and you could feel the wind, it would be more like a gentle breeze, even if it's going many tens of miles an hour, um, because it's, it's a thin push. Okay, so one thing we know for sure is that, well, of the many things we know for sure, one thing that's really important for our audience to understand is that Mars has virtually no atmosphere. It does have an atmosphere, but in comparison to Earth, virtually not. Uh, true. I mean, it has different types of clouds. It has um, uh, multiple layers to it. Um, there's some different temperatures to the different layers. I'm mm -hmm. actually more of a look down geologist and kick the dirt. And my colleagues tend to be the ones that are the atmospheric people that look up and, and they miss what's going on on the dirt. Fair enough. Okay. But, but Mars does have dust storms. Oh, yes. They have global dust storms that on occasion have obscured the entire planet from not only our telescopes, but our orbiting spacecraft. When Mariner 9 arrived, one of the first, um, I think it's the first spacecraft to orbit another planet, but it was the first one to orbit Mars. They showed up and it looked like a blank fuzzy blob. And they were worried that perhaps the cameras weren't functioning, but it was, it was that Mars was in, engulfed in a global dust storm. And those do happen. And we're still trying to understand what triggers them. Because Mars has no oceans, the dust storms can rage. Um, any sand and dust that by geologic processes is produced on the surface tends to get reworked and reworked and ground up smaller and smaller. And so there's a, a lot of very fine dust that has been falling on the ground, getting picked up, falling on the ground, getting picked up for not only years, but probably individual dust grains, probably thousands upon thousands of years. So wow. there's no ocean to soak it up, essentially. Okay, so now, so, so, so tell us now about how dust devils, uh, how, how, it's, how it's thought that dust devils might form on Mars. And if you can, if you can uh, compare that to how dust devils are formed here on Earth. Right. Well, um, fortunately, um, physics and science works the same everywhere we look, and that includes within the solar system and on our planets. So essentially, what happens is that the sun radiates the surface of our planets and warms them up. Um, mm -hmm. Surfaces that have water in them, because of water's tremendous capacity to soak up heat and not do much, um, and that, for that matter, it takes a long time for them to cool off, too. Because of that, moist soil does not heat up radically in the morning when the sun shines on it, mm -hmm. but dry soil does. So in deserts and arid places, and one third of the Earth's dry land is basically semi-arid or arid. So sun beats down on the surface, it heats up rather quickly, and the air, just the last few foot or two of air, at the very bottom of the atmosphere, touching and rubbing on that surface, that tends to heat up quickly also. Now it's unstable. It's less dense than the air slightly above it. And in addition, the Earth is, the atmosphere is trying to sort of transfer that heat up off the surface and up and mix it into the atmosphere. And it develops into circulation cells that, um, are part of a, a local regional style and different surfaces with different mountains or flats, um, rugged, rocky, and, and perhaps tree covered surfaces or very flat ones. They all sort of relate differently to how they're churning up the heat. But, and here's the cool thing to us, dust devils form where some of those circulation cells are coming together and uh, rising up, and that's where the dust devil is. So my career has mostly been about understanding how much erosion happens when whirlwinds get fast enough to pick up dust. Some surfaces, they, they can't erode dust from them, and you won't see dust devils. There may still be the circulation cells, but we can't see them. The cool thing about dust devils is that we can see them, and we're trying to figure out if there's, sometimes they're regularly spaced across the desert floor. And that's because that's an indication of these different sets of convection cells. So our goal is to understand not only what it takes to erode the surface 
and that gives us some clues about how strong the winds were, but also what the spacing is between dust devils and therefore atmospheric folks can reconstruct what the atmosphere was doing at that time and how it was churning along. And um, that means that NASA could hire, well, perhaps people like us to go back and look at 20 or 30 years of photographs of dust devils from the surface of Mars and reconstruct the lower atmosphere, connect that with all the other observations that were taken at various times through our study of Mars. We've got a flotilla of different, um, uh, different uh, orbiting spacecraft. And so if you combine all this stuff, the atmospheric folks can get a much better sense of exactly what the atmosphere was doing on those days and what its structure is. And they can turn that information over to the engineers who can plan the um, entry, descent, and landing phase of lander missions, which is the really nervous and exciting and dangerous part of, uh, of traveling. Just like Elon Musk said, he wants to land on Mars, but not crashing there. He wants to do it gently. <laughs> that might be a good thing. That would, that would be a much better day than crashing on the surface. So now all of this information that you have been pulling together, the studies that you've been doing, uh, certainly help you to some degree uh, understand a little, bit, uh, a little bit more about what Mars is, is like. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, Mars, like Venus, is one of those planets that's considered to be Earth-like. And you mentioned that one of the problems about Venus, of course, is that the temperature there can be 900 degrees Fahrenheit and 90 times the atmospheric pressure. So that does not necessarily suggest that it would be a place that we might consider trying to convert into a place more like Earth. But Mars, on the other hand, in some ways is a little bit more benign than Venus is. Yes, the atmosphere is very, very thin and the temperatures can be very cold. But on the other hand, that's a little bit more manageable than perhaps the situation is on Venus. So one of the ideas that has been circulating around in popular culture these days uh, and has been around for quite some time is the idea of perhaps trying to convert Mars into a planet more like Earth environmentally. So one of the things I thought we might be able to do is just look at this idea a little bit in terms of what we know about Mars and the Martian, the Martian environment and compare the Earth's environment, in a sense, to the Martian environment in terms of what would it take to alter the Martian environment to make it more like Earth to sort of follow along this idea of terraforming the planet Mars? Well, let's start with what Mars is like today. Um, Mars is a pretty cold place compared to us. Uh, it's right. a little further out, further from mm -hmm. the sun, but actually its thin atmosphere is mostly the culprit. Because the atmosphere is so thin, Mars does not have a greenhouse effect that is active like Earth has. Um, the greenhouse effect helps to trap uh, an added portion, so to speak, of the, of the heat that's coming from the sun. It's not just the heat that soaks into the ground, but then it sort of bounces back and forth between ground and certain layers of the atmosphere. That happens extremely well on Venus to the point where it's tremendously hostile. It happens yes. a fair mm -hmm. degree on Earth, and we've come to uh, found a sweet spot where a certain molecule is in liquid form, but also solid and vapor form, and I'm talking about water. Yes. So and we have a lot of water and the temperature and the greenhouse and all the things that have worked out over time and the history of our planet's evolution and aging have worked out to make a really nice hydrosphere on Earth, not on Mars. On Mars- so, uh, it, Go ahead. Um, on Mars, there is not that sort of effective greenhouse. It's quite cold. Um, and I am a little rusty on this too, but uh, I think maybe 120 below zero Fahrenheit is a common. Um, now, is that a nighttime or daytime temperature? I think the daytime is like minus 60, something along those lines. 
on on a on a really nice day uh, at, at, at at high noon in the tropics. Yes, yeah, the temperature can be a uh, balmy almost, summer day on yeah, a so balmy summer a little, day on Mars. It's a little nippy. Now I've been a, a photographer on a lot of ski slopes, and um, I've been down in the minus thirty Fahrenheit um, a number of times, and and we we know how we've been clever enough from more primitive materials to fancy space age materials. We know how to dress warmly for that. 120 below zero Fahrenheit is a, a little brisk by any standards, I'd say. <laughs> That's pretty challenging. That's um, pretty challenging. But, secondly, but as you say, but as you say, with the, with the atmosphere being so thin, it's very, very difficult for the Martian atmosphere to hold any kind of heat. Yep. And it doesn't have nearly the abundant and thick clouds, even though there are cloud systems and such. Um, the, the better the cameras have gotten from landers, the more we've been able to learn about the clouds. And the last few sets of missions, the Mars exploration rovers like Spirit and Opportunity, and then the Mars Science Laboratory like um, uh, Perseverance and Curiosity, um, have much better cameras and have been watching the clouds. But the clouds help bounce heat back down to the surface. And not only is the atmosphere thinner and there's not much in the way of, of a greenhouse effect, it also has um, fewer clouds to do that. The air on Mars is a little different than our air. It's predominantly carbon dioxide, almost exclusively. And ours is um, mostly nitrogen, a good chunk of a good percentage of oxygen and then a bunch of other little things, including water vapor and carbon dioxide. On Mars, as I understand it, it's about 93, 95% carbon dioxide and the rest is mostly water vapor. Um, so you wouldn't be able to breathe deeply and, um, uh, because there wouldn't be the gases we need to function, so that's a problem. And then because the atmosphere is so thin, it's also missing one of the components of Earth's atmosphere, which is the ozone layer which is very good at blocking um, a more energetic form of ultraviolet light. There's, we break ultraviolet into A, B, and C bands. The C band is, um, is able to kind of mess up fancy molecules like DNA. So if we were out in an unexposed um, place where we were getting the normal amount of ultraviolet C, uh, on Earth, we'd, um, we'd be uh, protected from it. On Mars, we would not. So the current, uh, so Curiosity rover carries an ultraviolet sensor um, package to measure just how strong it is at the surface. And right now it would be more than sun burning for us. And it would mm. also be nasty for plants. So, so there's some so different it seems things that aren't so good. It seems like Mars has a number of things that are wildly different from what Earth is like that make it really challenging. So we have mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere with little to no oxygen available. We are missing an ozone layer to protect us from, uh, that would protect us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. There's no water on the surface to speak of and because of all of these things, I mean, these are, these are the kinds of things that we would have to try to change in order to make the planet more Earth-like. So now I've, in some of the research that I've been doing uh, about what it might take to try to make Mars more Earth-like, I mean, obviously the, the one way we, we can go about this is we could simply say that, well, we have to figure out a way to provide more oxygen. We have to figure out a way to make the atmosphere thicker so that it can be warmer. We have to find a way to make water available or have enough abundant liquid water available to make it more Earth-like. And we also have to figure out some way to alter the atmosphere so that we get more protection from the ultraviolet radiation. But I think one of the other issues that Warming it up we wouldn't have to- be too bad either. What's that again? Warming up the place wouldn't be too bad an idea. Warming up would be a great idea. If we could thicken the atmosphere, maybe we could get the temperatures up. But another issue I've heard that is a that I think would be a major challenge is how do we manage to get Mars to be the to to be stable enough in its atmosphere 
that the atmosphere actually isn't being constantly stripped away by the solar wind. I think this is one of the things that you and I talked about when we were doing our pre-interview for this, and that is that the magnetic field, there isn't enough of a magnetic field at Mars to protect the Martian atmosphere from being stripped away from the electrically charged particles that stream through the solar system in what's called the solar wind. And unless we can do something about that, the idea of altering the atmosphere, making it thicker, providing more atmosphere is going to be a major challenge because the solar wind is always going to be stripping atmosphere away from Mars. Yep. So I think that's, 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 that's one major thing that we probably have to look into. But some people say it's not entirely impossible to protect Mars from that. Well, the, magnetic, uh, the magnetosphere around Earth is very strong. And only recently did, did uh, researchers detect the very, very faint, essentially non-existent um, hint of a magnetosphere on Mars. Um, so it doesn't have that benefit. Now, the reason why the magnetic um, shielding is helpful to Earth is that not only are there very charged, very energetic little particles zinging along, that can literally bump into an air molecule and kick it out of, of orbit, essentially, because it's so energetic and sandblast it off. There's also the problem of um, other radiation and energy from the sun warming up the upper atmosphere enough that some of those little particles, individual molecules bumping around in the atmosphere, just kind of get enough energy that off they go. So there's a couple of different ways that the atmosphere gets lost. And this is really frustrating because if you show up and, you know, you don't, when we build a project on earth, when we build some huge project, you have to start one step at a time and gradually build, build, do, do your thing. And it slowly um, accumulates to the new product, the new place that you're trying to build. While that's happening every second of every day, the solar wind is streaming across the atmosphere of Mars and, like you say, constantly undermining whatever efforts might be trying to um, create a bigger atmosphere. I, in my bit of prep this morning, I, I think I heard that two, two kilograms, or maybe it's a, a couple of orders of magnitude more, two kilograms of atmosphere are being stripped off the surface of Mars by the solar wind every second. Wow. And let's just say it's a measly two kilograms. That's what, five pounds of, yeah. five pounds of gases, mm -hmm. which is a fair amount of gas, but for us in our little lungs. But um, imagine every second after second, it's 3,600 seconds in an hour. And two kilograms every second are going off. And this has been going on for hundreds of millions of years a few billion perhaps, um, and it's going to keep going. So you have to produce more new atmosphere than the removal processes are, uh, are working on it. Now, back in the early Mars days, it was, I'm just gonna add one more way that atmosphere gets stripped off Mars. In the early days, when there were a lot of bombardments of the last chunks of the solar system sort of settling in on the, the planet gravity wells, um, as we can see from the moon, a lot of impacts onto these astro these uh, large celestial bodies. On Earth, our weather and erosion has smoothed all that over long long ago. But on Mars and on um, on uh, our moon and other bodies around the solar system, you can still see those scars. When those things would come in with forty thousand kilometers an hour, sixty thousand kilometers an hour, slamming into the planet the big explosion and ejecta and big crater made, it's literally splashing, not just rock, but it's splashing the atmosphere out into space. And because Mars is only the half the size of the Earth and it only has 40% of the gravity of Earth, it's not able to pull as much of that back down to the surface. And so that stuff's lost. So I'm not up on what percentage has been stripped off by solar wind versus what was splashed off, but these are the kind of processes that have made Mars's atmosphere so thin. 
Well, this is why I think this is such an interesting topic because, you know, we did an Instagram poll of uh, some of our audience in the days before as we were preparing for this program tonight. And we asked the question, do you think terraforming is possible? 137 people of those polled said, maybe, tell me more. 26% said, no, that's all science fiction. And if you look at some of the prominent people in the space exploration field these days and what they're suggesting about the possibility of terraforming, it actually is quite interesting because uh, you know, some of the things that are being proposed might sound like they're really fantastic or you know, really outlandish. So for example, uh, Elon Musk has said that one of the ways he thinks might, it might be possible to make Mars more livable is to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and provide more water for Mars by heating up the polar caps. And he proposed to do this by using nuclear explosives to generate enough heat to melt the polar caps, thus releasing the carbon dioxide and melting what water is frozen there to provide water for the planet. Now, I'd have to say that I think that's a pretty radical idea. But on the other hand, if we compare that with something that uh, NASA planetary scientist Jim Green said just recently, Jim Green said that he thinks it may be possible at some point in the future to create a magnetic field that sits at a particular distance in space between the Sun and Mars, what's called a, a, a gravitational balance point in space between Earth and Mars, that has enough of a magnetic field strength to be able to deflect the solar wind from Mars to reduce that atmospheric stripping. Now, these are both pretty interesting, pretty, I don't want to say crazy ideas, but let's say that they're out there ideas. Now, right now, Green doesn't think it's possible to create something with the magnetic field needed, but he suggests that perhaps it's possible now to create something that has a fraction of that magnetic field that could protect the planet. Uh, as far as the other idea of using nuclear, nuclear warheads or nuclear explosions to melt the polar caps, I think it all comes back to a question of how do you sustain a planet uh, or an altered Mars? So for example, if you can create more atmosphere, can you create some, some sort of a magnetic umbrella that will protect it from the solar wind uh, stripping effect that's been going on for the last several billion years there at Mars? And if you're going to uh, add more gas somehow, say for example, we want to we need more uh, oxygen at Mars, which of course we do if we want to terraform it. What's the process that's going to be used to produce more oxygen? And how do you keep that process going, considering that atmosphere is going to be continually lost from Mars? So I think there are a number of issues about terraforming that require much bigger thinking uh, than what we might be seeing uh, when we think about uh, the stories that we see in science fiction movies and science fiction stories and all those sorts of things where this process can happen in a really short time frame. In fact, some of the other research that I've been doing suggests that it would take at least several thousand years to begin to move in a direction where the amount of oxygen that could be built up in an atmosphere at, at Mars, say using uh, an altered cyanobacteria that's similar to the kind of cyanobacteria that was present on Earth in its early years as it began to produce oxygen, even if you could do that, it would still take thousands and thousands and thousands of years to build up the amount of oxygen that might be necessary to make Mars into a planet that's considered to be more, quote unquote, Earth-like. And then if we just go back to the water issue again, where do we get the water from? How do we produce enough water? How do we keep that water there? How do we keep the temperature and the pressure of the atmosphere appropriate for water to exist as a liquid on the planet? Because right now, as you pointed out, Steve, with the low atmospheric pressure, it's not possible for water to exist as a liquid on the surface. The pressure is so low, liquid water can boil away very easily. So I think there are a number of compound problems here 
that might make this concept of uh, terraforming Mars a real challenge? Well, one of the things that most people, including I think all of us, have trouble coming to terms with is we're talking about a planet. It might be one of the smaller planets in our system, but these are huge places. And, you know, I mean, we try to have these fancy flashlights that are like a million candle power and, you know, it, and it shines brightly a couple of miles maybe to a, a distant hilltop. And it's like, oh, look at that. That's nothing compared to trying to project the energy out to radically change the environment of an entire planet and oh, to right. yes. do it all at once. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple, of, a couple of big naysayer problems about this. One is um, getting enough energy to do any of these projects. Another is, is there enough oxygen, is there enough tied up um, carbon dioxide frozen at the polar caps, water vapor, is there enough water that's saturated into the soil and has become permafrost? There's probably a fairly good amount of water for astronauts to conduct their, their life-saving daily activities, and also probably enough water to, to make fuel so that they can fire off those rockets and come home if they need to. But, um, but to change an entire planet. So a, a recent paper by uh, Joukowsky um, and another author uh, examined, what if Elon's idea of detonating nuclear weapons on the poles were able to work? What would it take? Well, in order to create enough heat, apparently we need to set off something like 3,500 good sized nuclear weapons every single day for seven weeks. And apparently because of arms negotiation treaties between the nuclear powers here on earth, there's only about 3,500 active functioning nuclear weapons available. And I guess there's uh, two or three times that amount that are sort of in the shop, but even hmm. still, that would only, if all of those were operational and we could transport tens of thousands of rather heavy bombs from Earth to Mars with all the energy that takes, we'd never still hit the mark of 3,500 a day, every day for seven weeks. The second part of his, um, of his analysis was that when we did that, we would basically be vaporizing, I hope I'm getting this right, 143,000 cubic kilometers of frozen volatiles, meaning frozen carbon dioxide and frozen. Now, each, each square, each cubic kilometer is about, think of a box, about 4,000 feet on each side. Ooh. And we have to take that ice and not just melt it, but we need to get it into vapor form and apply a tremendous amount of heat times 143,000. And when that's, done, <laughs> when that's done, then the atmosphere would go apparently up something like 1% more dense. Oh my gosh. Meaning there's oh my goodness. near enough of those frozen volatiles at the poles currently, nor is there going to show up anymore to, um, to make much of a difference. Plus, okay. you'd have whatever the residual radiation is from tens of thousands of atomic weapons going off on both poles uh, for a number of weeks. So, okay, so let's so let's let's go in a, in, a, in just a slightly different direction as we sort of tie this and tie this whole idea up here. You know, we have a we have a lot of you know physical uh, we have a lot of physical limitations that uh, that challenge this idea. But is this something that we would say that we could that we could apply this kind of suggestion to is like as we see and understand things right now, this does not sound like a really feasible idea. I mean, is this one of those things that we would apply that kind of thinking to, as if to say that in the future there's some possibility that we might be able to have some energy source that would allow us to, you know put together enough energy to convert a planet like Mars into a planet it's, like Earth? It's very possible. 
it's very possible that five or 10 years ago, a, um, a teenager, a young lady, went to the Franklin Institute and got excited about some sciencey thing and is, as we speak, inventing some new technology that is not part of our consideration because we haven't thought of it yet. She is, but we haven't. And um, maybe there's going to be a great new tool, either a magnetic field generator or a huge solar mirror that can um, blast energy down to the poles, park one over the, the top and bottom poles of uh, Mars and, and warm things up. That's one side of it is, do we now or might we in the future have some super duper technology? The other thing is, what are the inventories of these necessary materials? The carbon dioxide, for example. And I think that's what the Joukowsky paper was trying to say is that there's just not enough stuff there to work with. And if we did mm -hmm. work with it, it'll probably take thousands of years. But I want to get back to something you mentioned about the cyanobacteria, if I may. Not if you make it quick. Oh, OK. So um, in the trilogy of Mars, Red, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars by Ken Stanley Robinson, he has colonists doing all kinds of clever tricks, releasing little balloons that would scatter plants adapted for the Martian world by gene manipulation to mm -hmm. slowly make more air mm -hmm. while also trying to warm up the poles, while also digging huge holes down into the crust to try to get closer to hot rocks and let that heat. That, by the way, that was crazy and is completely <laughs> infeasible. But the other it's, ones- It's science are, fiction. What do you expect? And he even mentioned, he's like, this is not a blueprint for how we do this in the future. This is right. more of a discussion on social changes of establishing a new world. Mm -hmm. And by the way, here's kind of some reasonably feasible ways to get about that. Well, odds are we're going to have to do a dozen different strategies all at once to accumulate enough effect and we're going to have to be really patient. So currently, most folks don't think it's realistic that in the next several generations, we will have made Mars any more hospitable than it is now, which is mixed. And therefore, we're probably going to be better off building shelters and le learning to work with better spacesuits and maybe going underground into lava tunnels that uh, lava tubes that have emptied out and now have this nice thick um, magma roof. And if you seal off a few holes, maybe you can have a city under there. When people go out, they're gonna have to be in, in modern slick spacesuits, which Elon Musk has done an excellent job with. And uh, NASA folks are coming along with even more durable suits that are gonna be um, effective soon so so we're so we're probably talking more like uh what we saw in the movie the martian than yes. uh what kim stanley robinson was suggesting for actually converting the planet uh in its entirety and i i, I don't know if it's fair to say this but in one of his later books the whole terraforming effort which has been going better and better and better and one of the books ends with the a lot of people swimming in a Martian sea. Well, later on, the, uh, the whole um, environmental biosphere crashes and they have to go back basically, the, the, essentially the atmosphere freezes back out. Uh, ah. I believe that's a, a correct uh, summation and yeah. it, they're fascinating books, I really recommend them. Um, but not every point in that book is to be taken literally. Uh, there are very serious challenges. Planets are big places. You know, uh, in that survey that we did of folks on, um, on Instagram, one of the things we found is that when we asked that audience, should we change other planets to be like Earth, 65 said yes, but 166 said no. And I think perhaps, you know, hopefully this discussion that we've had that has attempted to try to illuminate some of the challenges uh, that are presented by this whole idea might convince some other people that the idea of trying to terraform Mars uh, or any other planet, let alone Mars, is really an enormous, enormous, enormous challenge uh, that's going to require way, way, way more resources than uh, we have anything like we could deal with at all uh, in, 
uh, and a lot of people like this don't on. want that to happen. Because and there is that, and there is in that. The Tim too. Stanley Robinson series, there are the equivalent of the environmental um, Greenpeace and Greens here on Earth, and they're called the Reds. They don't want to mess with, and I have some colleagues that strongly feel this way. Should we go to another planet and mess it up, just like we're doing here? And there, <laughs> there's a, his books were about trying to relate to all the different societal struggles that go into making a world, including the factors that say, live, with, live in your space suit and don't mess up the planet. Um, yeah. you, you don't need to run around in shorts and, and um, you know. And I think, and protect, I think the- Protecting uh, yourself a... from, uh, from the ultraviolet <laughs> rays. Uh, you, you can uh, put yourself in a spacesuit and go out and do your business on Mars. Don't make Mars a messed up Earth. And I, and, and I don't think that, value I don't think that little, I don't think that little umbrella is going to help you one whit. <laughs> uh, Steve, I want to say thank you very much for joining us this evening to talk about, uh, to talk about terraforming Mars possibly and helping us understand a little bit more about the planet itself, especially in comparison to Earth and uh, helping us sort of analyze these different factors that would go into what would, what it would take to actually take over another planet. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank Hope you, you'll be willing to come back and join us again sometime in the future. Uh, a shout out for oh, we have a shout out for you, Steve. Where's it from, Linda? It's from Adrian Zacconis. He said, yay, my friend Steve. Your friend Adrian Zacconi says hi. Oh, well. Hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. That's great. In That's great. I, I think it's only fair that I disclose that Steve and I were, uh, were uh, college buddies. Uh, back in the day when we were in undergrad school, and I had to uh, help him through every course. Every th how do you how do you think Steve got to be a planetary geologist? See, I told you, right? Okay, but <laughs> when we were at St. Lawrence University, uh, let's go Saints! Thanks a lot, Steve, for joining me, and I hope you'll be willing to come back and join us again. Good luck with all your research out there in the deserts around uh, Reno, Nevada. Thank you, sir. Take care. Well, I hope if you were considering the possibility of uh, terraforming a planet, you have more information now that can be of use for you as you go about figuring out just how you're going to do it. And uh, if you come up with a plan that you think is going to work, despite everything that we've uh, been able to bring to you this evening so far about this, please let me know. I'd be interested in understanding how you might, uh, might think about doing that. Uh, this is not to poo-poo the idea that Elon Musk believes that he would like to have colonies on the Mars on Mars in the next hundred years or so. But you know, the thing about it is, I think it's going to be way, way, way more like what we saw in the movie *The Martian* than it is going to be like the whole hog com complete conversion of that planet to be more like Earth. Remember, it's going to take a lot more resources, a lot more energy, and a lot more uh, protection to get that planet to be more like Earth, way more resources than we've ever seen or have had at our, uh, at our disposal to be able to do something with. And I guess the other question that we might ask that Steve was pointing to is, why would we put all those resources and all that energy into trying to transform Mars when we really could better spend those resources and that energy taking care of this one planet where we are now? After all, how many people are gonna be able to make the move from Earth to Mars anyway? Okay, so uh, I'm glad we had a chance to chat about that topic, and I'm, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please send us your questions. We'd love to know. Let me check in with Linda and see if we have any questions. Adrian, I believe that Elon's idea sounds like a new sci-fi movie plot. Ah, Adrian says that she thinks that Elon's idea sounds like a new sci-fi movie plot. That sounds like a great one, Hollywood. Why don't you uh, take off with that one? Tibba said, thanks, Steve, for sharing information about and who was that? Hibbert. Oh, Hibbert says, thanks a lot, Steve, for sharing information about dust devils on Mars. Greatly appreciate it. OK, great. So folks, let's go on with the uh, rest of our program this evening. Uh, we're, uh, as I said, we have lots of really great stuff that we can see in the evening skies. Uh, Mars, unfortunately, is not one of those items right now, but it'll be back later this year for you to take a look at in the evening sky. Let's go on and see uh, some of the other things that are available. Uh, in the time that we have left for our program this evening. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to uh, jump out to take a look at uh, one of my favorite um, web apps that I love to use. 
uh, that web app being uh, the star map Stellarium. You all know how I enjoy using Stellarium. I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to go right over here to Stellarium, and I'm going to bring that screen up. And uh, just let me do a little bit of housekeeping here so I can make sure I have plenty of room for everybody to see everything here. Let me just do this. I'm going to move this right out of the way, get rid of my own little image there. We don't need that. Here we are. Okay, stellarium-web.org. You can see it right up here in the search bar is the uh, star map that I use for these programs. And I like to use this program because it's so easy to use. I'm going to use this little menu tab here to get rid of the other menu bar on the far left of the screen. And as you can see right now, hopefully centered in the in this on, on my screen right now, as we can see the night sky as it appears as we look toward the north. We can tell it's north because down here, uh, right at the bottom of the star field, you can see the letter N for north. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate this around by uh, clicking and dragging. And as I click and drag on my mouse pad, I can pull our direction around to the direction south. And this is the orientation direction that I'll uh, suggest that you use when you want to go outside to look at the night sky, because as you look toward the southern portion of the sky, objects will appear to rise over on your left in the east, pass overhead in the direction towards the south, and then set over on your right on the western side. So objects will rise in the east, pass overhead, and set in the west. And if you stand looking at the southern direction, you'll have most of the sky out ahead of you. So as we look out into the evening sky right now, at this time of evening, 8.46 p.m., we have a tremendous amount of really nice bright stars that are all part of this winter circle group that I spoke of earlier. Centered right in the middle of this group is the constellation Orion. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to magnify my screen a little bit, just like this, so I can point out these stars to you and you can see where they are that make up Orion the Hunter. As I said before, seven bright stars, and I'm going to encircle them right here. One, two, three, four. As you can see, they are Betelgeuse, Belatrix, Rigel, and Saif over here is this star in the lower corner. And then the three stars that are across the waist of this hunter, Orion, right here. So this is Alnalak, Alnalam, Alnatak, and Mintaka. You'll see Alnalam is here on the right, Alnatak is in the middle, and Mintaka is right here, the end star right here. Now the outline for the constellation itself, the outline of the hunter in the seven stars, the two stars at the top, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, mark the shoulders of Orion. Betelgeuse is the top right shoulder, Bellatrix is the top left, is the left shoulder. Rigel is the left ankle, and Saif is the right knee of Orion. And the three stars across the middle mark his waist or his belt. Interestingly, about this constellation, it contains one of the only uh, nebular objects that's easily visible to the naked eye. This is the nebula called M42, the great nebula in Orion. The word nebula means cloud. And this is a cloud of gas and dust where stars are actually being born as we speak. So you can take a look at this with a telescope or even a pair of binoculars, and you'll be able to see the fuzzy cloud of gas and dust from which the stars are being created. And that's right here at what's called the Sword of Orion. It's a group of three stars that hang down from the belt of Orion. And of those three stars, M42 is right in there. And so when you take your binoculars or point your telescope in that direction, you'll be able to see that cloudy, fuzzy patch of sky that is the nebula of Orion. Betelgeuse is a red giant star, so that's a great one to take a look at. And the other stars are nice and bright as well for you to take a look at, and you can see the shape without too much difficulty. I'm going to take us back out a little bit, not quite as zoomed in, so that I can show you the entire winter circle. First, I'll bring up the constellation outline so you can see where they are. So here's Orion in the center. And if we use the belt stars of Orion, these are the convenient indicators that show us those other constellations that are part of the winter circle. So let's first go up in this direction uh, toward the top of the sky from Orion's belt up to the right. We come to a bright star up here at Taurus, the bull called Aldebaran, Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus. 
Aldebaran is also a red giant star. And using a pair of binoculars, you can see that reddish tinge in both uh, Betelgeuse and in uh, Aldebaran here in Taurus without too much difficulty. Tonight, as you can see, the moon is almost directly above Aldebaran, so it should be easy to find either one of those with no difficulty at all. But in the face of Taurus here, this constellation, this is actually meant to be the shape of an animal. It's the upper half of the body of a bull. And so this red star here at Aldebaran marks one eye of the bull and is part of a V-shaped group of stars that make up the face of the bull that we see right here. So as we're looking at this, we can see this V-shaped grouping of stars that make up the V-shape of the face of the bull. The back of the bull goes up in this direction where just above the menu bar here, you can see a small little cluster of stars called the Pleiades. Many of us are familiar with the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters as they're also known. And these are stars that mark the back of the bull right here. The horn tips of the bull are one right here and one over here, a star that's part of another one of the circle of stars that's part of this constellation called Auriga the Charioteer. I'll tip the sky down just a little bit more so we can see where these all are. There's Taurus, one of that group of the circle right there, connected to Auriga. Auriga the Charioteer right here. Now, Auriga has a bright star called Capella, which as you can see, is up pretty high in the sky, but it's a nice bright star. And in fact, Capella is uh, a, a star that has three other small stars as companions. These three stars right here are part of this. And often, uh, Auriga as a charioteer was famous because during one race, this of course is ancient mythology, during one race a few thousand years ago, Capella, uh, I'm sorry, Auriga as a championship charioteer was challenged to carry a goat under one arm to see if he could still win the race. Well, what he did was he not only took this star, Capella, that goat, but he also took that, that goat's three baby goats. So we have Auriga, the charioteer, carrying Capella and the three baby goats, the three kids right here, as they are called. Now, if we go a little bit over to the east, we come to the constellation Gemini right here, marked by the two bright stars, Pollux and Castor. These two stars are almost equal in brightness. And so you can understand why this constellation would be known as the twins, because these stars are equal in brightness. If we come down a little bit, we come to another bright star here at Procyon. This is part of the constellation Canis Minor, the little dog. A little bit further, we come to Sirius, the bright star in the constellation Canis Major, the big dog. And these are the two hunting dogs of Orion, and they complete the circle that we know as the winter circle. So centered on Orion, we have Taurus, Auriga, Gemini, Canis Minor, and Canis Major. Those constellations make up the winter circle. All of them are easy to see. All are easy to recognize without any difficulty at all. And if you're out at around 9 p.m. in the evening, you can see them with no challenge whatsoever. If you stay out a little bit later, what we'll do is we'll advance the time a few hours here. We're now at almost 9 o'clock. We're going to advance the sky a little bit. And if we come around to midnight, we can see that the winter circle has moved on toward the western portion of the sky going in that direction. Let's just get rid of that information. We don't need that at the moment. And we can see that the main constellation of the spring sky, Leo the lion, begins to make its appearance high in the east south, in the southeastern portion of the sky. So we can see how the seasons of constellations progress across the sky as time passes. So while you're out, if you happen to be out late, you can look for the constellations of the winter sky and the oncoming constellations of the spring sky as well. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for this particular portion that we've, oh, I know, there was, there, I'm sorry, there was one, one other thing I wanted to do there. Let me go back to that for just a moment. Thank you, bear with me as I just switch back to that. Okay, here we are. I wanted to show you where the planets are in the evening sky. So let me just change the time. I'm gonna take us back to just about sunset. Here we are, just a few more minutes back. And you can see as I'm backing things across, the sky is getting a little lighter over toward the west. But now you can see as I rotate the sky around to the southwest, 
Here's Jupiter in the southwest. Down below, getting lost in the glow of sunset is Saturn. And this little dot right here, way down close to the horizon, there's Mercury. That's where Mercury is. So as you can see, at 7.30, if I could move that box, we could see it a little bit better. But I'm just going to increase the time up here to about seven to about 5.40 in the evening. You can see there's Saturn right there. There's Mercury right there. So as you can see, you don't really have much time between 5.30 and 6 p.m. to catch a view of Mercury this week. And if I were to advance the time by day, you'd see how these planets are slowly sliding off to the southwest. So again, make sure you take a look for those planets between 5.30 and 6 p.m. as the sky is darkening, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury. I'll stop sharing my screen. We're going to go on now because next coming up, International Space Station, as I mentioned, let's take a quick look for that. I have that screen all set to go. Let me bring that one so you can see where that next view is coming up here. I'll adjust my screen a little bit so you can see. Okay, so what I have for you here now is a map of what the sky will look like next Tuesday evening, the 18th of January, when International Space Station will be easily visible in the sky right around 6 p.m. If I check the timing here, it shows me that right down on the lower southwestern horizon at 6.23 in the evening, International Space Station is going to appear from the southwestern horizon head up across the top of the sky to a maximum elevation of, I think it's 78 degrees. Let me just check and make sure here. I went backwards there. I don't need that one. Here we are coming up. We'll go down and just check right here. Yes, the maximum altitude is 78 degrees. And as it comes up across the top of the sky, it's going to go right past that bright star Capella in the constellation Auriga, the charioteer, at 629. And then right after that, it will disappear into the Earth's shadow. Now, of course, International Space Station will be quite bright and easy to recognize as it travels in a straight line across the sky. There's no flash, there's no sound. And if you take a look, hopefully the evening will be clear, you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to catch a view of what it looks like and you'll understand what I say, what I mean when I say it hardly makes any sound at all. So this map comes from heavens-above.com. You can see in my URL bar at the top of my page, it's www.heavens-above.com. Please be very careful to make sure the dash is included. Uh, you don't go to good places if you don't have the dash, so make sure that dash is in there. Thank you very much. And you can select any one of a number of days in the next week when International Space Station will be easily visible in the sky. I typically look for those nights when it has the greatest brightness, as you'll see in the first column, followed by the highest elevation that you can find for the pass. So that Tuesday, the 18th, has a pass that's negative 3.9 magnitude, very, very bright, with a maximum elevation of 78 degrees at 828 in, uh, 628 in the evening. So I highly recommend that one. I'll stop sharing my screen again here. And just check to see if we have any questions. Well, we have a couple of shout outs for you. Oh, we have some shout outs. Great. Yeah, that's the two names. And hi, Derek. This is Ms. Cullen. I am so proud of you. Oh, hello. How are you, Maxine? Thank you. Say hi to Mrs. McCullough for me, please. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us tonight. Hey, Carl, thanks a lot for that. Carl Cohen says I'm the best. He knows what he's talking about, right? No, I didn't pay him to say that either. But thanks, Carl. Thanks for listening. And we had shout outs from Cherry Hill, Pittsburgh, Connecticut. Shout outs from Cherry Hill, Pittsburgh, Connecticut. Stockton, California. And Stockton, California. Wow, that's great. Hey, you know, all of you folks that are viewing this program from someplace else in the country, not here in the Delaware Valley. This information is good for you as well. You may have to adjust your viewing times slightly, but other than that, everything that we've talked about here will also be visible for you as well. The sightings of International Space Station will certainly be different, but you can use that same program to help you figure out when you can see International Space Station over your location. 
If that site seems to be too complicated for you, that's quite all right. You can go to nasa.gov and you can click on their tab, spot the station. There, all you have to do is put in your zip code and it will give you a list of the next viewings or uh, visibilities of International Space Station along with maps over your area. So there's a number of different ways you can do that. That would be, that'll be very cool. That'll work really well for you. Uh, as I said before, there are quite a number of people in space these days. Uh, I think the number is 13 right now that are in space in various space stations. So there's a lot of people up there. Don't forget when you're out there looking at space stations, there's International Space Station as well as the Chinese Space Station that's out there too. So just think, at this point now, it has been, let me see, almost 25 years in which there have always been, there has always been someone living and working in space. So that's become now part of our reality, people living and working in space, from the Russian space station Mir through International Space Station, and now the Chinese space station too. That means that it's a regular part of uh, our existence now of people living and working in space. Well, folks, I wanna thank you very much for joining us for our program tonight. We had a great opportunity to learn all about terraforming the planet Mars. We learned about dust devils on Mars. We, under, we hopefully have come to understand more of the differences between the planet Mars, planet Earth, and planet Venus, and which one of those planets might be the best one for us to consider putting our resources and energy into preserving. Hint, hint, hint. It's this one, in case you didn't catch that. And we've also had an opportunity to catch the Winter Circle of Constellations, learn about the Winter Circle of Constellations, and which targets might be good for that brand new uh, telescope, that holiday gift we may have received. Uh, and also hopefully have been uh, maybe inspired to go outside and take a look at the night sky as a way to uh, take a break from watching television all the time, just reconnect with the universe, and learn a little bit more about the wonders of the universe that's right there over our heads to see. No matter if you live in an urban environment or a rural environment, you can still see a tremendous amount of the night sky no matter where you live. We're excited to offer our, our iconic Franklin Institute exhibit experiences once again. The Franklin Institute is now open Wednesday through Sunday. You can go to our website to get more detailed information and to purchase tickets. Let me also remind you though that coming up on February 18th, is the opening the world premiere of the Harry Potter experience at the Franklin Institute. You've got to come see that. I'm sorry, Harry Potter, the exhibition. You've got to come check that out. But guess what? I'm going to advise you to get your tickets online now. If you get your tickets online now, you can, you can secure both a date and a time of your choice to see the exhibition. And we want to make sure you get those tickets before they sell out. We've sold over 85,000 of those tickets already before the exhibit even opens. So you still have an opportunity to get tickets, but get your tickets online so you can secure your date and your time to see that exhibit. Again, it's a world premiere at the Franklin Institute, the only place in the city or anywhere nearby, anywhere you're gonna be able to see it. So come see it with us and make sure you, you get your tickets now. So go online to sign up for your tickets. Uh, don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter my handle is at cool astronomer, and you'll catch me there with daily updates for uh, viewing various things in the sky, uh, as well as keeping track of space exploration milestones that are happening over the next month. My motto is eat, breathe, do science, sleep later, and I hope you have a great time outside taking a look at the evening sky. Thanks for joining us tonight. Enjoy January. Spring is just a few weeks away, just around the corner. We'll see you next month when our guest will be Kalpana Pot. Kalpana Pot is a space enthusiast, a blogger, a Griffith Observatory docent, and my co-host on our new Astro series, A Practical Guide to the Cosmos. You'll hear more about that next month. So join us then, and we'll talk about all things night sky and that as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Have a great January. So long. And remember to keep looking up. <laughs> yes, we heard that, Steve. <laughs> it was the tagline from